Hi, I'm Candice fretner Durye. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And um, today we're gonna talk about attachment bonds, trauma bonds, and boundaries. And um, I'm gonna go over quickly um, attachment bonds. Attachment bonds are, there's typically three types, and these are um, implicitly formed typically within the first two years of, um, of our caregiver's relationship with us. Um, and that that's contingent upon, across time. And these attachment bonds can change and they are malleable. In fact, the current research shows that even in when we're in close committed relationships, those attachment bonds can be um, changed and adapted to a healthier um, attachment style. Um, and it normally takes on average about two years for that to occur. But when we're first, um, when we first are creating these attachment bonds, um, we create them in this implicit, implicit memory. And um, there are the three types, secure, anxious, and um, ambivalent avoidant. The, um, in, the secure is, it used to be a larger percentage of our population, um, and over time it's diminished. And I can name off of different reasons for that or be speculative, but it, for this purpose, we're, we're just going to kind of know that it's a fact that it's starting to diminish. It used to be on the upper end of 60%, and it's concurrently now looking more like 25%, unfortunately. Um, and so that that's worrisome for our future. It's worrisome for our children. There's a lot of different things. Um, but the essence of a secure attached individual looks like um, the individual um, is raised um, uh, from their attachment figure attachment system and as they move out into their environment um, that attachment figure serves as what's called a safe base and the individual and the child moves further out um, to explore the world and can return to their safe base for comfort and nurturance and occasionally when the child is not able to return it can call out the secure the, the attachment figure is within reach with of that child that it can call out and that attachment figure will come to soothe or comfort the child and then the child can re um, uh, be able to re-engage in that behavior again. Um, and so, you know, we think about that, you know, in kind of a simplistic way of like, what does that safe base look like? You know, when you first carry a child for a mother, it's in the womb and then their arms typically, and then they're placed in a bed or bedding, um, crib, um, room, and then um, they kind of move throughout the house as they, as they gain more access to walking. And then they move to the backyard, and then they move to the front yard, and then they can move to the street, and then they can move to other houses and other, you know, so then they start to get, their world starts to grow and get bigger as they build that trust. And they're able to recognize how far they can go and call their attachment figure should they need help. And so as we instill that, we have a balancing that happens, which is care and dependence and um, independence. And this is um, formative for later on because it's really formative in the phases of interdependence, which are necessary for healthy relationships. We're not looking at being too independent um, and isolative, and we're not looking at being overly dependent and not able to soothe and looking for you know, um, a relationship to take us over or to, to tell us what to do. Um, we have this nice ability of interdependence, which is the give and take in a relationship in which um, self-expression is encouraged and, um, and self-control, and um, there's a fruitfulness to the relationship. Anxious attachment tends to be what we are more known for recently with helicopter pa parenting, and that concurrently is the largest attachment system that we see out there. Um, most individuals fall under an anxious attachment now. Um, that didn't used to be the case, but it is um, with with current research, it's showing that. And this looks like where the child starts to leave from their attachment figure, but the attachment figure um, discourages, inhibits, and with an anxiety or frightful disposition, the child doing that type of exploration, they thwart it for some reason. Um, normally denoting that there's some kind of non-safe experience or the child is not capable or um, the, or the skill set that the child has, they're, um, they're uh, short short sighted that short sighting that child for the exploration the failure and the ability to return back to the caregiver and there's also this ability for the caregiver to read or register the child has become overwhelmed to a certain point and so the caregiver then needs to attend as opposed to the child having an emotional disruption but being able to um, return to the base or to their safe base so anxious um, attachment looks like, as an adult, someone that struggles when it's an implicit 
response system as they get older, they some of that struggles with being able to recognize that their world um, has safety to it. That that when they leave, um, there is a semblance of some type of safety. There's some type of provision made. Um, things, interactions are typically on most parts safe. There are things to watch out for, scrutinize, be aware of, create z resilience through resiliency through failures are seen um, in an anxious attachment style as catastrophic. A secure attachment failures is seen as part of development in life. In the ambivalent style, we have a caregiver who is inconsistent. Um, and this caregiver uh, at times would attune and be present only for the child's emotional needs to be opened up and presented, but the caregiver then couldn't tolerate them and would then dismiss the child. And so you have this constant what we call back and forth um, in that attachment style. The child then learns to not depend and they also learn to um, not be independent. And so they're not consolable because they don't have enough of development for that nervous system and neural system that's developing to know how to, um, to create kind of a, a semblance of safety internally. And so, the, so individuals with this constantly can feel like they feel internally, they feel chaotic, particularly if the world around them is calm they will start to resonate like that's very uncomfortable it's very chaotic for me internally to feel this way so they're constantly looking or seeking for that kind of um uh, opposite um type of attachment style that ambivalence to danger and the ambivalence to comfort um, and safety and security and so these individuals struggle because their caregivers were constantly um thwarting their efforts for regulation and, and what we might call homeostasis. Um, so that's those are the three main attachment styles. That third attachment style that I talked about, that ambivalent, is on the rise and I believe it's at 35% now of our population. It's, it's, it's gaining. Um, and so we see a lot of individuals with more of these um, attachment styles that don't seem to fall in line with what um, might be called or dubbed kind of resilient, secure attachment styles. Then we have trauma bonding. Trauma bonding is when you have one of these attachment styles, um, and these are our everyday interactions, typically. Um, and they're kind of repeated and, and done over and over again, and they move from implicit, and then we start to see our world through those lenses, and we start to identify things through those lenses, and we those then become explicit. But a trauma bond typically tends to be when we remain with an attachment figure, um, and they they basically inhibit the ability for us to recover internally and create the only way to recover from the trauma that they have created is back through them. And so um, this is counterintuitive in some means. It, it, it's not forgiveness. So it's not like a caregiver has um, done something wrong, which we all can which we all can attest to we've done at some point. <laughs> points in our lives um, and then we go oh no I screwed up please forgive me and we respect our child or our partners need to reconcile that be resilient maybe even get a hug from us but need to kind of take in and and work through the process of forgiveness and then reconciling and that's a that's a natural a really healthy way to attune in relationships but a trauma bond looks like um, an individual growing up and a trauma has happened by the caregiver. So whether it be um, someone that is um, angry and mad, like your caregiver is angry and mad for a behavior that you've done. And, um, and you're standing there and you're like, you're in fright, right? And it's, children are really easy to see that they're scared of someone who's angry and disappointed with them. But the caregiver gives you a bind. And the bind would be, don't you be scared around me. Right, but I'm terrifying. But don't you show me that emotion of, of fear? And so the child is then having to shut down their own internal systems, imprint this experience of anger, negativity, nastiness, but create a state of a, of not only ambivalence but just kind of disinterest or dissociation, and they mimic in some ways. Um, shutting that system down, it can feel in some ways 
it can be a numbing, it can be um, a disparaging, disparaging kind of experience, but they're, they're forcefully trying to shove down, their true experience would be is, oh my gosh, you're terrifying, what the heck are you doing? Right, why are you yelling at me about this? I'm, you know, I'm a kid, right? Or you're yelling at me about this, you're really mad, okay, I wanna be really scared about this because this doesn't seem like a big deal to me. I don't understand this, right? And the parent then can attune and readjust and say, well, I am mad and this is why, or, you know, or calm or provide comfort or provide some type of structure. And the child can then come around and attune. Without that though, the trauma bonding, the child stays in the relationship. And sometimes you can, um, you can recognize these things by caregivers. They'll say, don't you cry about that? Or, um, um, you should have known better or you know, there's these things these shame responses that get added to it So not only have we done something wrong. Maybe we did maybe we didn't This is another part of it that could be crazy making the, the primary caregiver can can create a situation in which They even think that you've done something wrong, which may not have been something that happened at all But in their mind they were suspicious of something that was going on and then they just instituted it They were they were accusers, right? Um, and then suddenly children naturally feel shame about that. Well, if they're not allowed to reconcile or, or even trying to kind of, um, come back to the caregiver to create a nice homeostasis of, okay, we're okay. Then what ends up happening is they have to shove down the emotional input and they have, they pattern then in this bond of that this scary bonding kind of experience, if I move away from you. I'm gonna get in more trouble. If I experience myself, I'm gonna get in more trouble. If I recognize the situation, the reality of it, this is gonna, I'm gonna get even more terrifying. It's gonna be even more my fault. So this becomes a pattern and individuals tend to bond based in traumatic relationships. So the trauma becomes comforting. It becomes something that they learn to disconnect from their real experience of themselves. And so they can do this in relationships too. Abusive relationships will do this all the time. And they call it the honeymoon phase. Excuse me, sorry about that. They call it the honeymoon phase, um, where the relief of disconnecting from your sense of self and the abuse that's happened um, hits in, and then they can kind of idealize um, a sense of some semblance of normalcy before it hits again. But typically in a trauma bond or in in parent parental relationships, when you try to move away, you feel terrible. And part of that can be that implicit experience from the past, but it's wrong. It's upside down because what's been ingrained in this trauma type of bonding and attachment system is that you somehow are wrong for moving away. That's what you concurrently think. But really what's been laid is that when you move away, you actually give yourself the distance that you need to experience what's really truly, how you really truly emotionally feel about this relationship or about what's being done to you. But you've never been allowed that before. And so that gets overlaid then with the messages of you're being disrespectful, don't have that feeling, don't have that, don't you leave, don't you dare walk away from me. Those kinds of experiences go along with that. And so suddenly your ability to move away from the, that attachment figure feels wrong. It feels like you are doing something wrong or you are bad. And that's not actually of God, that's of an accuser keeping you trapped in that relationship. This is using your flight or fight responses um, in a quite devious way because you have three ways that you could actually um, move into a relationship when you feel shame. And a lot of times when children are developing, their first inclination is to, um, if they're, if they're in, if they're, if they've upset their caregiver is to think, Oh no, I did something wrong. And they want to try to fix it somehow. Children are notorious for this. And so their shame responses tend to be larger. It's also a formative experience. They're forming their, um, their, uh, uh their consciences. And so they're looking constantly modeling, identifying what, you know, what am I doing? How is this world responding to me? What is being taught to me? What's being, they're absorbing constantly trying to figure out. And so when, when that's happening, if someone you're, if you're, if you're absorbing and trying to figure out your world and you're pulling that in and someone is shaming that, 
and they're adding a ton of shame, then your world is suddenly looked at as you are constantly doing things wrong. And there is actually constantly something or consistently something wrong with you. And those that in that flight or fight response system gets activated when shame, those shame responses and flight or, response, flight or fight responses are activated along the same lines. So you can either run, but if you're not allowed to do that, you can't. You can either fight, but if you're little and you depend on your caregiver, you're not gonna do that. So then the third response is please. And oftentimes what um, individuals will do is they will learn some way to manipulate the situation to make it better. Whether it be to make the caregiver better, to comply, to um, to make to do something to try to make themselves feel better. They'll do something in that moment to try to please. If they can't do the other two experiences, they will try to do the third, which is to please. Typically, the pleasing one is the one that typically goes first for most children. Um, unless we've got some of the other attachment stuff going on, children typically try to acquiesce to their caregiver and please, particularly when they see their caregivers upset. Now that doesn't always mean that the children are going to, that's not going to be healthy for them to always see their caregiver upset, um, to learn to internalize that, but it's a part of development. But when that upset caregiver, one, doesn't concretize the, um, the wrongdoing, meaning it's, they don't, they don't really tell the child what's going on, why, what they're doing is wrong. It leaves them off balance. They don't, um, they extend out the punishments or they exacerbate the punishments. So the punishments are not matching consistently or they're for durations that are just not tolerable for that age. Um, those are other ways. Or um, when the child is expressing and exhibiting their natural response system, they they borrow, children borrow our neurological systems constantly. And they do this by looking at our faces, by looking at our breathing patterns, by assessing what we say, do, how we do it, and even comfort when they come into us for hugs, they're borrowing our nervous systems and looking how, on a physiological level, how to comfort themselves. Well, when you grow up, if you weren't allowed to attune to a nervous system because it wasn't allowed for you, or when you tried to attune to your own nervous system that was disallowed, you, you're you feeling out of control anytime you have an emotional system come up. And typically we get into these emotional relationships and have these emotional systems come up when we have friendships, when we have spouses, when we have when we have children. When we're on our own, kind of think, okay, we got this, we, you know, we can deal with some stuff, but the real rubber hits the road is when we're in community with other people and these start to come out. And so here comes boundaries. This is the third part. So as we've now developed and we've kind of figured out, okay, I've got some of these things going on. I can look at some of this attachment stuff. I know I've got some trauma bonding that's been happening and I know how that's capitulated forward. Now, um, now how do I set boundaries or why are boundaries so hard to set or why do I feel guilty every time I try to tell a parent who's been abusive to me and continues to be no and boundaries are basically can, can be basically put down to two big things and I'm, I'm gonna make this pr pretty brief but I'm gonna give you two books that are great um, let me give you the two books first Cloud and Townsend book called boundaries and then Gregory Popcheck um, why are all these people crazy I think is what the name of the book is and they're both about boundaries and they're both great and they're both with a Christian perspective. Um, but boundaries can be brought down to two things, wants and needs. I mean, that's basically it. When you look objectively at something, sometimes we get confused in our minds um, what charity really is. Charity is the ability to offer lovingly and caringly for another's betterment. We want them to get better. So we provide in any ways that we can or that we're able to. This becomes a problem when we provide what someone wants and we think it's for their betterment, but it's not what they need. So it's ultimately is not for their betterment. And we confuse those two. And so the best scripture for this is Paul. Paul wanted so desperately for the Lord to remove his thorn in the flesh. And the Lord did not. Why? Because he didn't want to give Paul what he wanted? No. It was because it wasn't what Paul needed. He gave Paul what he needed, so much so that Paul was able to not have the removal of the thorn in the flesh, but to have so many consolations that he couldn't he couldn't even imagine. He didn't, it, it tempered that experience of the thorn in the flesh so much that he saw 
his consolations with uh, with our Lord so much differently and was filled completely. You know, he wrote, he wrote. so. Um, so boundaries are these things when we go into these trauma systems, they're hard to set because we oftentimes are assessing what the other, what are, are in an unhealthy boundary situation, what they want. And we don't step back to take a break to assess what they actually need. And so if you think about this, one of the first stories in Boundaries book with Cloud and Townsend talks about a, a woman, I think we can all relate to this. She um, runs all around and does all these errands and she's exhausted and she's so tired but she tells herself this is what the Lord wants. He wants me to be productive and happy. And then she goes and she helps her mother and um, and her mother um, doesn't thank her very much but she says, you know, I do this because I'm charitable. And then she has to do her daughter's um, costume that night and, and sew it up. But her daughter is snapping at her and, and she says, well, I'll just, I'll just finish it up because, you know, she... She'll, she'll thank me about for this one day. And then her mother comes over again, but she's supposed to spend time with her home, husband, but her mother takes up all the space. Her husband goes to bed early, finishes his food, and her mother is just complaining, 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 and just drains her. And by the end of the night, she's feeling horrible. And she's sitting there, and she goes, well, I guess this is what it is to be in a Christian life. And he breaks down this whole thing. He says the whole entire day was made out of wants. It weren't, they weren't assessing for what was needed or what was possible or what was fruitful or what was virtuous. When we are looking into these relationships, having a limit on, our, on how much we run errands throughout the day for ourselves, knowing our own self-control. If I go this far, it's going to extend me this much. Um, so I need to dial that out. Having um, children who treat us unruly or who, um, who are rude to us without correction right, without consequence, really isn't good for them because then they're just materialistic. Um, having relationships that overwhelm our primary relationships, like whether with God or with our um, spouses, and they don't really produce any fruit, they don't get any better, um, is really not healthy for us. It's not what's good for them. It may be what they want, but it may be not what they need. And so that's a big thing when you're thinking about setting boundaries with your attachment figures or relationships or you're fearful of this kind of stuff. Think about what it is that they need and what it is that you need. And that is gonna be a lot different than what they want, which may be they want you to act and be a certain way, and what you want, which would be to not have any conflict. And it may be that it's needed to have conflict. It may be that it's needed for there to be some distance or separation. It may be that there's needed for you to enter into that space and discuss this. And so that's a different experience, so. I hope that those three categories help and that um, if you have anything, um, any questions, you can leave them below. Have a good night. Take care.